Hello, everyone. I'm Jennifer Kale, Associate Professor in the Department of Dance. And I'm honored to be the artistic director of this event and one of the contributing artists. On behalf of the International Writing Program and the Department of Dance and the UI series, Art and the Pursuit of Social Justice, welcome to our collaborative event, Eyes Closed, Eyes Open. As we strive toward ideals of justice and equity, diversity and radical inclusion, we find ourselves in a precarious moment pulled simultaneously by hope and trepidation, seeking possibility while recognizing the threats that stand in our way. This duality is reflected in the prompt given to writers and dance makers for their collaboration. When I close my eyes, I see the future. When I see the future, I close my eyes. So welcome to all of you out there with us right now on February 25th at this 5.30 hour. And welcome to all of you who are watching this at some future moment, having logged onto our virtual dance studio page, which you can find by uh, searching the title of this concert, Eyes Closed, Eyes Open on the UI webpage. So glad to share this work with all our communities near and far. I'd like to start by expressing great thanks to all the people and entities who helped this event come together, including our esteemed commentators and the directors of the two programs represented today, Rebecca Kowal of the Department of Dance and Christopher Merrill of the International Writing Program. We also owe thanks to the outstanding staff who have helped us with our prompts, with wrangling our artists and our online presence in video editing and marketing, Hugh Ferrer, Shelley Criswell, Jill Tobin, Kristen Helligy, and Alex Bush, and grad student Nick Coso. To those who assisted with translation, Natasha Dorarichova, Kaylee Lockett, Rebe Alawati, Kathleen Archer, and Shelley Criswell. To Nick Art for hosting this webinar. Hi, Nick. And contributing resources and support of his office. To George de la Pena for assistance with production to Alan McVeigh and the Division of Performing Arts for financial and other support, to the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs at the US Department of State who made the participation of the International Writers Possible and Jill Staggs, Program Director, Program Officer, excuse me. And finally, and especially to all the creators and collaborators involved in this project, seven international authors from the IWP, five faculty, eight graduate students, and one alum from across dance, music, English, and art departments. Sincere thanks to you all. And now I'd like to introduce to you our invited commentators, um, Rebecca Kowal, professor and chair of the Department of Dance at the University of Iowa, where she teaches courses in history and theory, she is author of Dancing the World Smaller, Staging Globalism in Mid-Century America, Oxford Press 2020, How to Do Things with Dance, Performing Change in Post-War America, Wesleyan University Press 2010, and co-editor with Gerald Sigmund and Randy Martin of the Oxford Handbook of Dance and Politics 2017. She's grateful for the opportunity each year to collaborate with the International Writing Program and looks forward to this iteration of our work together. Christopher Merrill has published six collections of poetry, many edited volumes and translations, and six books of nonfiction. His writings have been translated into nearly 40 languages. His journalism appears widely, and he has served on boards of many national arts institutions. As director of the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa since 2000, Merrill has also conducted cultural diplomacy missions to more than 50 countries. Welcome to you both. So we'll be making time for some brief discussion with you at the midway point in our virtual concert here, and again at the end of the six works that are premiering tonight. In the meantime, all those gathered on Zoom are welcome to post comments and questions here by using this Q&A function here on the bottom of your screen. Uh, you may also see the raise hand icon there, but we won't be using that. Just type your comments and questions into the window that opens up when you click Q&A. If you're on YouTube and you want to write a comment or a question, you can switch over to the Zoom uh, link uh, using the link on your YouTube page. So we'll close this event by reading some of your comments and sharing some of your questions with our program directors as a prompt for their closing discussion. 
Finally, and just before we begin, let me thank all the artists for spending in sum about six hours conversing with me about their projects, their collaborators, and some thoughts on art and social justice. I wholeheartedly apologize to them for boiling down those six hours into about six minutes. Um, it was painful to choose only a couple moments from those wonderful talks, but I'm really excited to share some sense of those conversations with everyone. So included in our show are these two video collages of these interviews with everyone. Um, one will appear at the beginning and another at the midway point. So with that, welcome again. And let's begin with our first interview compilation and the first half of the program. And I will see you all on the other side. very excited to be working on this dance collaboration for the Iowa University. To know that she trusts uh, whatever we make is like a great feeling. Like this working process in a collaborative process, trying to be vulnerable in like our practices in the sharing of like, this is what I'm doing and this is how I arrive to what I'm doing. Our first conversation was great. I felt like we hit it off um, right from the get-go and hearing her interpretation of the poem that she wrote um, after reading it really uh, kind of enlightened what I was already thinking about. The uh, dancer also uh, read my poem really well. Mm -hmm. uh, she, uh, grabs, she grasped the essence um, of, of my poem. But I found that the, the letters, the the style of Arabic writing is just so beautiful in the way that it curves the movement of the letters themselves play into the movement of the dance. Actually, I mean, the, the, the essence of the whole collaboration or this whole project is all about coexistence mm -hmm. <laughs> and living together. I think that it was, um, it was nice to be just in conversation with um, another man from such a distance and um, different kind of cultural influences in our lives, different relationships to land and home, different relationships to family and loss and um, finding um, kind of common language and which, you know, ended up being a foundation for like how we were working. I loved what he's doing. I loved, I loved his ideas. I loved his body motions. I loved everything. So it, it was good start. I'm really proud of what came together and it feels like it's not trying to save the world or be that one thing, but it also um, is quite beautiful in its honesty, sincerity, representation of, of what this was and who we are in this like brief coming together. And I was really drawn to her poetry. So I, I just felt kind of excited and giddy to meet her and hopeful that uh, she would be interested in, in what I have to offer uh, simultaneously. And the conversations have been have been really wonderful. We've talked about process, um, like the press, my process for writing poems, her process for and how she thinks about movement. Um, and I think we're on the same page in a lot of in a lot of ways uh, that we really are both interested in process. I've really appreciated thinking about our collaboration as as really a duet and 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 something that uh, is driven by Danica's share. Like what she wrote is at the center of all of it. And what I'm doing is hoping to highlight her words and highlight what she's sharing. Um, so I really believe in it. And in the way that it resonates with me, I believe it will resonate with others. It's been challenging to think about how to make something together, given that we can't really be together, <laughs> like in a space. It was this kind of multi-angle conversation. And I felt really proud of like the, just like, the mode of listening that we employed in that conversation together and that there were um, spaces and silences that we were like happy to just sit with and, and listen to. And I felt like that patience is what allowed those ideas to unfold the way that they did. The sort of how we're maneuvering all these boundaries, right? Um, and even the work in itself, the, the, the collaboration in itself is, is basically an exercise in 
um, working with, through through boundaries and collaborating between between language, distance, um, mediums, form, um, and all of those sorts of things. And perhaps it's, it's a, a reminder of how the future is happening now. Um, there, there's, there's just an inherent vulnerability, um, of course, in making any creative work, but especially this, I think improvisation. Um, it sort of, if it's, if it's happening, you know, in a way that I, I think is positive, it sort of demands a, you know, a, um, a, a certain, you know, mental attitude of being present and listening and all, all of these kinds of things that I think really map directly to a, maybe a more positive way of just interacting with each other as human beings. What choices should we make in order to really uh, support this theme of, you know, like who's being represented and how are things being shared and what are ethical and equitable practices? Uh, I feel like that was really an interesting concept for me to really make sure I was attending to. Finding the duty in that moment to be like, to know that you've been given like this gift, this access to someone's life or work or process like is a gift and like how to treat, how to treat that information with care or how to ethically sort of like resource that information in your working. Um, is an interesting process to be engaging in. By the way, I am knowing now uh, new people, which is good for me. And we are making new relationships. We are making new projects to it, together. Maybe in the future, it will be some, somehow different, somehow mm -hmm. bigger, somehow maybe in places, maybe in my college, maybe in some other places. So it's a good start. Then, so what you want me to do is like, I really want to make this as a really truly collaboration. It's not like, Okay, here is the poem and do something about it. Or here is the music and do something about it. And we really sit down and just talk. Entonces, lo que queríamos hacer es realmente encontrar el lenguaje de de lo interdisciplinario que pudieran dialogar y no solamente estuvieran acompañándose. When I'm part of something, what is working really, really good. All the process feels so comfortable and, and really nice, and that makes me feel so complete and full of, well, at least good thoughts. These kind of collaborations are a medicine for my my soul. In my experiences, this is probably one of the the collaborations that I have enjoyed the most. what you dare to open at the threshold. Open your eyes to a present, bare as a winter tree. The tree, a raw nerve, not dead, but at rest. A mistake to think, now as always. Soon enough, the bud and blossom, the green leaf and husked fruit. Soon enough, the small jaw makes of the hard shell dust makes of the sweet meat a feast. What wild, soft hope to suppose that what was will be. For now, take the attitude of work, then the attitude of rest, then work, a curious industry, then rest. For now, grab the hand that pulls you up, the hand that gets you dressed, the hand that soothes you when you wake in the dark, startled and damp. Is the hand your own? So be it. Is the hand another's? So be it. There is a future in your mouth, smoky quartz on your tongue. Where will you hold it? Belly, teeth, or palm?
what you dare to open at the threshold. Open your eyes to a present bare as a winter tree. The tree, a raw nerve, not dead, but at rest. A mistake to think now as always. Soon enough, the bud and bloom, the green leaf and husked fruit. Soon enough, the small jaw makes of the hard shell dust, makes of the sweet meat a feast. What wild, soft hope to suppose that what was will be. For now, take the attitude of work, then the attitude of rest, then work, a curious industry, then rest. For now, grab the hand that pulls you up, the hand that gets you dressed, the hand that soothes you when you wake in the dark, startled and damp. Is the hand your own? So be it. Is the hand another's? So be it. There is a future in your mouth, smoky quartz on your tongue. Where will you hold it? Belly, teeth, or palm? سعادة غامرة ورعب لحظات قبل الظفر أو الخسران قلب ملاك ومزايا شيطان أتحرك أنا الإنسي نحو الوطن تقف طائرتي عند الشباك أنزل وأحتضن أختي المنتظرتين ندوى وفدوى أنتقل بعد الجدار حيث يستوطن الأغراب أبحث في الحقول عن بيتنا القديم وألاحق بقايا الزمان أجد مكان رائحة الطابون ولا أجد فوقها بقايا أهلي أخرج من جيبي فأس حقلنا القديم ينبثق منه آلة حفر ضخمة أضرب ضربة فأصنع حفرة بحجم بناء تابوت من الخشب الأحمر في القاع أتحسس صدري أسفل عنقي أشم نفسا وأتنزل إليه على مهل كلما غصت كلما تلاشت التفاصيل تنعدم الرؤية عندما تلامس رجلي الأرض أتلمس لا شيء ترتطم ركبتي في النعش أمد يدي وأنزع الغطاء تنبعث في الأرجاء أصوات أنفاس متحشرجة ألمس الجثة من تحت الكفن بقايا عظام أحملها وأرتقي للأعلى أصوات الرعد ودقات قلوب 
تأوهات وهمهمات أشعر تحت أصابعي تكون الجثة من جديد اللحم يكس العظم حد الاكتمال السواد إلى سواد ومض السماء يشير للأعلى والومض يظهر تفاصيل الاقتراب أحط على اليابسة أضع المنشول أحاول فتح الكفن من جهة الرأس أسمع أصواتا من السماء أصواتا خافتة تقترب من بعيد نعم افتح يا بني أنا أمك أقترب من فك الرباط أسمع أصواتا أخرى لا تفعل يا بني تذكر دائما أن أشجار الزيتون صادقة لا آبة أضع يدي على صدري وأفك رباط الكفن تهز السماء قهقهات تتلى في الأرجاء ترانيم يهودية يخرج الجسد الجسد يردد مع الترانيم إنها إنها أم جوزفين تصفعني بيدها فأرتمي على الأرض تشم أنفاسا بعد قرون اندثار أيها الغبي عدتني للحياة من جديد <تصفيق> تطفو مرتفعة بالهواء للأعلى للأعلى وتواصل تلاوة الترانيم كلما قرأت كلما ازدادت قوة وحجما لا أزال أضع يدي على صدري يبدو أن الأوان حان أخرج من تحت قميصي الحجاب الحجاب الملفوف حول عنقي منذ صغري أخبرتني أمي ألا أنزعه أبدا وأخبرتني أن أم جوزفين التي دفنتها ستعود الخلاص بالحرق لا بالدفن نزعت الحافظة الجلدية لأول مرة وجدت بداخلها تميمة مكتوب عليها نصوص ثلاث بدأت أتلو من الآيات هي تصدح بالترانيم أنا أتلو خاشعا تلك حرب تطفو حولها الشياطين بينما الأرض ملكي والهواء حجارها والذكريات أرفع صوتي بالتلاوة فتهبط من علوها ويخفت صوتها أزيد مجدا بينما تخور قواها ترتمي على الأرض بشكل كامل تصمت التفاصيل أقترب منها وألبسها التميمة حول عنقها تستقر على صدرها تبدأ أم جوزفين بالصراخ حتى تتجمد يذوب عنقها ثم رأسها ينفجر جسدها إلى أشلاء ينزاح الظلام تصف السماء تعود الحياة أرى بيتنا وحجرة الطابون تغني مجموعة من العصافير أبي في الأفق يحرث الأرض بالثور 
أبحث عن فدوى وندوى أخذهما ونحلق سويا Pertenece el oído humano a las caracolas. Los dientes a las huellas de los ojos. Cuando llega el verano y el granizo, el cuerpo es una grulla de papel danzando en un teatro de sombras. hacia el peligro, él se detiene. Si me detengo, avanza el pensamiento. Dio desarrollo por mis antebrazos al árbol deshojado de la sangre. echada boca arriba es su mano en reposo.
Wonderful. Thank you, collaborators. Um, so now we will just spend a couple of minutes hearing from uh, our invited commentators. And um, I think the only prompt I will offer to start with is just thinking about the, the prompt that the artists received to make the work. Um, and, and then the broader framework of this concert kind of participating in this series of art in the pursuit of social justice. Um, but then also just remarking on things that stand out in the work. Would, would anyone like to start? <laughs> How about you, Chris? Sure. Well, earlier today, you and I were talking about the the question of surprise and uh, what's surprising in these three works is the uh, way it is something about how uh, in collaboration all kinds of things can happen. When Donica is reading her very beautiful poem, we have one way of thinking about the world. And then uh, when the dancer comes in, we have another way of thinking about the world. And then when we have the two put together, the voice over the dancing, uh, it opens, I think, a kind of crack in the world and all the habitual ways that we think about, uh, that we go through our, our days and nights, uh, suddenly we see the world anew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Rebecca, do you want to pick up on anything there? Yeah, I think that's a really wonderful way of starting. I think um, one thing that I'm just really savoring is the extent to which these works really bring us into worlds in our imagination, but in others' imaginations. And we are transported um, with, uh, with the sounds of of words and speech with um, images and, and, and just sensory information. And I just think that um, the ways that these works uh, help transport us into the experiences of others and, and help us imagine the worlds from many vantage points, I think uh, is really um, the potential for art. And in this particular case, um, these these really profound combinations of poetry and, and movement um, to speak to uh, the possibility of just getting closer to one another um, in conversation with one another. Um, and I think that the other thing that I'm really noticing is the extent to which there is listening that's being performed um, in these works. And I think that that also is very much a kind of modeling for a way that we can be better together and, um, uh, um, you know, work work together to um, to to imagine a, a future um, that is more in harmony. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Um, <laughs> well, I was going to kick it back to Chris, but I'll just interject that um, something that I was caused to think about is vulnerability and, and the sort of inherent precarity of being in a body. And, and that um, that vulnerability like, sort of cuts through in, these, in each of these works in a different way. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking about sort of like the digging in the dirt and the sort of like, um, the tactile sense and the story of death and rising and just we don't like to in our day to day think about <laughs> where we're all going to end up but also um, how it is that these fragile bodies spend their time here and I, I'm thinking of um, in, in the last collaboration Marlene on the street with the truck barreling down the road and her seemingly tiny self compared to that. And it sort of jumps out at me. Um, our vulnerability is one of the reasons why we are moved to think about justice, to think about how we live together and to make that, uh, or to improve on how we're, we're doing that. So that's where, where my mind was going. Um, Chris, I'm wondering if you wanna follow up on 
anything that you heard <laughs> the two of these characters talking about. One thing that came to mind uh, watching this, um, there's a very beautiful poem by the French surrealist Andre Breton, who said, the act of love and the act of poetry are incompatible with reading newspapers at the top of one's lungs. And it seemed to me that when we bring together dancers and poets uh, and see what kinds of new worlds can be created there, it's a perfect antidote to the talking heads on uh, the news every night uh, who speak from hardened positions uh, and usually in language that is pretty boring and pretty repetitive. And what a really interesting poet and a really interesting dance maker do is to use the language, whether of words or of gestures in radically new ways that give us a sense of what else might be possible. Yeah, yes, that. I, I was writing to you earlier about um, this very thing of when I watch the news, whether it's true or not, I just have this sense that as the talking heads appear, I already know what they're what they're going to say, and I'm yeah. hardened in the face of that. And and I was thinking about the the opening work by Donica Kelly and um, or Danica Kelly and and Mindy and the element of surprise and the, the capacity of art to kind of surprise us or shake us out of our expectations and and open up a space to, to rethink or reconsider. Um, I, I think without that, we're lost. We're, we're, we're not going to make any interesting and new decisions um, as a community. Well, what routinized language does is make us numb. And we turn to art with the hope of shaking ourselves out of that feeling of paralysis, of numbness. and. Uh, Danica's poem, uh, there's that wonderful line about the attitude of work, curious industry. And that's such an interesting juxtaposition of the notion of work, which is also a form of industry, but it is rooted in curiosity. And curiosity is at the heart of what happens in the best collaborations. One dance maker has a thought that possibly communicates with what the poet is doing or or not, and then we see where, where it might, the next thing might go. And maybe it's what would make work more humane. Yeah. Rebecca, you, you get the last word and then we're gonna go to the second half. Well, this is speaking to what you both have said. Um, I'm just thinking about the ways that news just prompts a kind of reactivity. Just as we might anticipate what people have to say, we're also conditioned to a certain response. Um, but um, or reaction, let's put it that way. Um, and what I'm imagining or what I saw in, in these works was more of a responsiveness. Um, so in the listening and the openness, there is also um, a receiving of, and then um, a kind of moving with, and that is something that is happening together in the, in the moment. Um, and there's just a sense of in the moment in all of these works and in a kind of delicate um, dance um, of responding, uh, responding one, one person and another. Um, and I think that, again, that's just speaking to the possibility for art to open us up to other ways of being in the world that, um, uh, that, that, um, that portend the possibility that maybe things could go differently. Yeah. And, and I was just, if I could just jump in and say, when I thought about that very simple prompt, which inspired Abdul Muti to write a 22 page long story, that was a story that did not exist until we gave him this one very simple prompt. And then, of course, Tony brings us into the snow and then there's a fire. Who could imagine any of those things would happen? But what, what a delight to go on that journey. Yeah, and this is a great segue into our second half to say that of all the conversations I had with the artists, this was a very consistent theme of that the collaborative, the artistic and collaborative process itself and this like humane mode of listening and responding um, is, is the very basis of the artwork, but it's also the very basis of, of any hope we could have about 
how we could do things in the future together. So we'll hear a little bit more of that in this uh, second interview series. And so once again, let's cut to um, the second half and, um, and we'll see you at the end for a few more comments. That's a very hard question. <laughs> I'm like a black person who's lived in America uh, my <laughs> entire life. So it is hard actually to imagine a future uh, with, with like holistically more freedom because that does not seem to be in many ways the trajectory. All I can do is try to figure out how to be safe inside of that and how to make my art inside of that um, and how to cultivate in those spaces community friendship and love. We work to make that hope come to true, but we are not sure what, what will happen. So we are doing our best. We are working, we are connecting to each other, but there's something life it will not give us. So we are just fighting to take that thing from the life. On a personal level, I am a, I am a pessimist and it is something that I acknowledge and I work, I work on it and I want to be a positive person. Very well. I'm a cautious optimist. This past year have been really feeling like charged in a sense of like, oh, like things could actually be better and like seeing more people being interested in making things better um, has chart like made me feel more uh, like I can make some kind of impact in the world. I feel optimistic because I feel like even though it's in the path of history and time late, <laughs> I feel like the um, energy around um, specifically white supremacist thinking and the ways that's embedded in all systems that we are a part of, I feel like I'm just seeing and having conversations with more and more white people who are recognizing that for what it is and knowing more and more about that. And I do think that really matters, unfortunately, even though there have been many folks for long periods of time who have been staring right at the same things. This project, it really wake me up because uh, before this project, always I had the, I always wanted to, and, and sometimes I really make myself to don't be negative, but be positive. But this project really, I think that opened my eyes to be, yes, be positive, but at the same time, we had to see the reality of what we are living today. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, we are living in the terrifying time. It's, it's really sad about this pandemic. You know? it's, it's really, really, uh, really sad. And I think we can find in the horror, beauty in the horror, in the in the bad time, we can find the beauty all the time. That my work is it's a it's a place of sanctuary for me, and so it in itself is like a positive entity in in my reality. I think I can always find the beauty in what is being created. I think I'm definitely an optimist, um, and I think I think just in terms of just life experience in itself mm -hmm. and things I've experienced in my own life. Um, I think it's it's definitely made me an optimist. Just, so just the idea of when you think of when I think of myself as a younger person and maybe being being very sort of angsty and anxious, um, you know, and seeing how life has un unfolded um, and realizing that sometimes, um, in fact, a lot half the time my own imagination was quite limiting in itself, right? And so you realize that you really feel like there's something much bigger than you that has bigger plans. Um, so I'm really about sort of like going yeah and i think about it even in my practice like needing to get these points across because there's this underlying hope for a future like if we get this down there can be something ahead if people understand these concepts now good things will follow so um how you make yourself an instrument of the present moment determines in some way what is possible afterward and i think that's a wonderful call to pay attention time right now is um, I think what at least I, I've met in it is um, there's a necessity for that kind of 
bravery and optimism. I'm trying to be positive. I'm, I, I know that I can change life and minds when I'm teaching, when I'm sharing knowledge, when I'm with people and trying to share everything. I know that I can do it there. At least in my lifetime, this feels like we're at a sort of unique moment of maybe actually being able to really um, realize uh, something, you know, different or, you know, I, I mean, I, I never want to like abandon the power of like aspirational and like transformational thinking. I guess I, I naturally just tend to lean pessimistic, I kind of naturally a cynic. Um, but at the same, I mean, and of course that, that but that's also broadly speaking, sort of at odds with everything I just said. Prepare for the worst and hope for the best is like the the thing that went through my mind and then I was like, oh God, I'm that person. Uh, I think I am an optimistic person that love pessimism. I love pessimistic authors. Uh, I don't know if that make any sense. I'm gonna give a really dissatisfying answer, which is that like, I think that it's like a little bit of both. Um, there's there's a lovely word in, in Arabic uh, that was used uh, as a title of a very famous novel called uh, Al Mutasha'il by uh, a Palestinian writer named uh, Emil Habibi. Um, Al Mutasha'il in, in Arabic, it, it's as if you are taking those two words that you mentioned, um, optimistic and pessimistic together. So you combine them together. So let's say that I'm both. <laughs> Some, and maybe this is it. I've been reading books about the end of the world um, and like fiction, fiction, fiction. And maybe that's why I'm thinking about this. Um, but um, there's hope, but Maybe I, I do close my eyes when I see the end of the world. Or I do close, I close my eyes. Yes, I close my eyes and that's it. Talking about, let's, let's close our eyes and dance in the future. Let's close our eyes and draw in the future or, or do something in the future. This is what we need, not just close our eyes. We need to open our eyes in the future and to make it true, to make it on the ground. This is what we need. Everything that we're doing here is like, is evidence in a way of sort of this uh, hopeful um, outlook that I was kind of mentioning before I, you know, waxed a little cynical. Um, I mean, like we're, we're, people people have been brought together um, to make something um, across like time, space, and, and discipline. That alone, just that like this that this is happening and like that these works are being made, I think is, um, you know, evidence of of like the possibility that we have for like a, a far more positive future than the present we currently inhabit. When I see the future, I close my eyes. Tears licking my cheeks. I remember that once I had trouble sleeping, trouble dreaming, trouble surrendering. 
even past the world ending. When I see the future now, my eyes are wide open. I have stopped keeping a good memory of bad things. The joy I have waited for is here, making my heart sing with the joy melodies of laughter is here. There she making drags herself to sit inside my stomach. I am full, belly gorged, waist thick. She has fattened me with sweetness, tells me to be soft and open, holds my hands, crumbles the grief to dust, washes the ashes off my fingertips. Joy restores the air in my lungs. I have stopped gasping, stopped running from sleep, breathe, she says, made it, even past the world ending. I am nobody. I spin in a strange and nameless orbit that cannot see me. I am the falling lifeline in my mother's palm before she died. I am the drawing of a squeezed heart on a wall immersed in moisture. I am the first day after parting my beloved. I am the first 15 minutes of a long, long night, which feeds on my life as much as it desires, and leaves my heartbeats pounding whenever your name echoes in my head. I am the nobody who desires to summon you after I have delivered you. I am the embrace between two strangers when love abandons them. I am the imaginary presumed city in your head, without a river, a plain, or a mountain. I am the margin in a single, lonesome book begging you to read before your bookshelves cast me out. 
I am the air in your shadow, unknowingly hidden from you. I am the wall on which you hang your photos. I am your unseen center of being. I excuse you for not seeing me. For I am the soggy dust that whispers to you, I am no longer here.
Mm-hmm. 
Amazing. What an amazing um, spontaneous conversation that's captured there between Layla and Will. Um, yeah, so let's, we have um, just a little less than 10 minutes um, to reflect on a few more thoughts about these works, the theme. Um, and uh, Chris, would you like to start us off again or? <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about was um, in the, the poem, uh, I am nobody, which depends upon the repetition of I am, I am. In poetry world, we would call that an aphora. Uh, and then when you you take, uh, when Kitty takes the, the very beautiful Arabic script, and that becomes the jumping off point for her, her dance. Um, the thing that came to mind was it's, this whole time in the, the, in the pandemic has been awful, but uh, Zoom has allowed us to think creatively in different ways now. And uh, uh, we've been doing this collaboration for a number of years and I've always been inspired by what the dancers and the writers come up with. But there's something about this conversation this year over Zoom when we can't actually reach out to one another, but we can continue to make meaning in really interesting ways. And when we get to the very end, I am your unseen center of being. I forgive you for not seeing me, for I am the damp dust that whispers to you, I am no longer here. That seemed to me to be, those seemed to me to be three lines at the heart of this whole, the notion of art and the pursuit of social justice uh, that we, we, as artists, we forgive you for not seeing me because in fact, you have not had the capacity to see me, for example, uh, any number of reasons why we might be remain unseen. And art is one of those ways to see anew. And how this pandemic has um, made us more aware of, of who's invisible or how we're invisible or the struggle to become visible. Um, exactly. And the sort of wispy, the choice of Katie to sort of create these figure lines and, and how, how um, empty they, they seem in, at points. Yeah, I was struck by that as well. Um, Rebecca, do you, would you like to chime in and give us something else to think about? Um, well, I was thinking along those lines as well. Um, I was thinking about uh, just the prompt and its invitation to allow us to think about how we see and um, how what what goes into who we see and how we become recognizable to one another and how we become comprehensible to one another mm. and I think that um, I think that there's something about this exercise and and I, I think that um, just to kind of speak to what you and Chris have already offered, this exercise this year that um, kind of takes us into a new dimension, just um, visually and sensually. Uh, and it's, it's been really sublime to, um, to realize these collaborations in a stage setting. Um, and it's, it's a wholly different um, exercise in this context using video and, and a kind of filmic perspective. And um, I'm just really interested too in um, the ways that that allows us to transport ourselves into different places and spaces um, and to imagine dance and words on different planes um, in different ways. And we've never really had that kind of flight of fancy before and, and, and those capacities to transcend kind of our physical reality um, and, and this, this particular um, situation, I think, uh, has allowed us to do that. And I think in doing that, um, I think is really 
allowing us to ask these questions about seeing one another and being comprehensible to one another um, and how we see in, in new ways. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. I, the, I miss so much and I will never give up <laughs> this, um, this work that we do as, as dance makers in a shared physical space with embodied co-presence. I mean, to me, that is lifeblood, that is vitality itself. But <laughs> again, with um, what this pandemic is revealing to us and, and sort of being uh, forced into other modalities, you know, in some cases kicking and screaming and in other cases, kind of like with, with lots of curiosity and enthusiasm, there's something about this format um, and the way that these particular artists have, have worked together that's, that's really showing me something about the importance of access, that, that as, as beautiful as it is for us to haul ourselves into the same room, it's also a barrier of sorts and, and it's difficult and it's expensive and there's all these things around it. So um, yeah, just in terms of, of art and the pursuit of social justice, but also the social justice of art and art making. It just makes me think a lot about, about access and the benefit of this um, mode of, of communication. Yeah, there was another thing I wanted to talk about um, that's related, but a little different. And that's something that you said in the, um, the interviewing about making ourselves instruments of the present moment. And I think that, um, a number of artists are talking about the artist's role as an instigator. Um, and in, uh, and I, I'm, I'm really curious to hear um, your and Chris's thoughts about how that plays out here uh, and um, advancing difficult conversations uh, from, from the perspectives of, of this work. Yeah, take it, Chris. A good question. <laughs> One of the ways I would think about this is that um, to one silly idea, one strong, uh, maybe more profound idea. When in in uh, Jennifer's piece, when the the four figures suddenly start, they're throwing or catching the snowballs. What went through my mind was that scene in Elf with Will Ferrell and uh, when he's throwing all of them which I think is what happens in any great work of art is that, that silly things come up and, and profound things come up. And then the second part, the, the, the second thing that came to mind was that in the last piece, and I encourage everyone in the audience to make sure you go to the website to read the works. Uh, in, in this case, the, uh, uh, Paula wrote a really beautiful prose poem, uh, um, much Pamela, too long. Pamela Ron Sanchez. Pamela, sorry, yeah, too long to be turned into a dance, perhaps. But in fact, it it's clear that it's the springboard for Will's improv improvisation and Layla's improvisation. And uh, the other thing that went through my mind was a, 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 an early poem by the late Michael Harper. Uh, it was an ode to Miles Davis, and it goes, uh, a friend told me he'd risen above jazz. I leave him there. <laughs> and in some ways, what, what's happened is we've, the dancers have, and the musicians have left the words behind and we're in a new space, which is the province of art uh, where we believe anything can happen. Yeah, I mean, in a way that was the impulse to close the concert with that work that was, yeah. that was without the words, just in a way, hoping that that all of the words that we had already seen and heard so far would be kind of resonating right. in that moment. Um, and also to me, the, the sound of Will's playing was very much like a voice. Yeah. Yeah. And even though there weren't actual words attached, I mean, it, it really communicated kind of straight to my gut Yep. And um, likewise, with, with Layla's um, treatment of, of that moment and that relationship, and it led me to think a lot about the overall themes of the concert and how the pressure of individuals contorting themselves, like kind of like trying to swim, I know almost like she was kind of swimming through the air and, and trying to find a way and then 
kind of finishing in these contortions and somewhat crumpled um, on the ground. I just, I was really musing about the kind of um, the outside pressure, inside pressure. I don't know where these forces are. Maybe sometimes these forces are coming externally. Sometimes they're coming internally in terms of this world we live in and how we kind of digest and adopt all of our own <laughs> oppressions. Mm -hmm. um, but it was such a clear um, kind of visceral take on, on the moment. And I really appreciated that so much. Yeah. 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 I was interested in um, just uh, the ways we've talked about um, art as a kind of modeling for communication and also as a kind as a representation of ideas. But then in this sense, it's kind of an embodiment of um, uh, an experience. And um, uh, yeah. uh, uh, it allows us to experience the going through something. Mm -hmm. that I think um, is really, and, and not at that visceral level, but I think is, um, it's very powerful in thinking about the artist as an instigator in, in doing all these things at once. Yeah, and I want to say our author, Wana, was such an instigator for yeah. <laughs> that she is a force, first of all, and I have an art crush on her, um, but her absolute commitment and advocacy for the idea of joy as like a choice and as a radical choice and a choice that is, is absolutely necessary and important to make. I mean, that really moved us all. And we really tried to be faithful to that tone and, and that um, commitment on her part. And, um, and then sort of the beginning and the ending of that half, it just reminds me of the this labor that artists do of of holding the, the optimism and the pessimism in each hand and, and how they hold spaces for us to kind of work through some of our own stuff on that point. That's the way in which they embody difficult conversations. And some of those difficult conversations are with ourselves. And uh, that's what happens in, the, in, in the, these three pieces. Hence the, the boat going up and down uh, in the snow is, um, is pure delight, but also Sisyphean uh, angst, right? <laughs> yeah, there's an edge there. It's, yeah. it's amusing, but there's an edge. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, thank you both so much for this conversation um, and for lending some perspective and some, frame, some frames we could use to experience all this. And thanks to everyone who has joined us out there and um, uh, some of the questions that came in um, were actually for the artists and they're not necessarily with us today. And even if they are, they're not like able to answer. So we're gonna copy those and, and see if, if we might just extend the conversation maybe on our, our webpage, our virtual dance studio page, uh, which you can find by searching Eyes Closed, Eyes Open on the University of Iowa website. So. Um, thank you all. Thanks to all the artists and everyone who helped contribute to make this event possible. And um, yeah, Jennifer, thanks to you too. Yes, thank you for putting yeah, this together uh, with great. such style. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure and look forward to seeing you all next time. Exactly. All right. Thanks. Thank Bye. you.